So my company is a plant genetics company. We are doing our best to understand the cannabis genome. So since 2014, we've been collecting samples from all around the world and taking out the DNA and sequencing the DNA and comparing it. And I'm going to try to explain why we would do a thing like that. So in all of that data, there's the answers to some really big questions about how the genes of the plant control the characteristics that it has. And we think that ultimately in there, there's going to be answers about how we match different kinds of plants to different kinds of patients. But to start with, we, we just had two, uh, we hoped, simpler questions. One was kind of a basic science research question, and the other was more of an industry question. So the first question that we wanted to answer was, how did cannabis evolve and where did it come from? So we know that it was domesticated about 10,000 years ago in Central Asia. We know that humans then took it with them to every single corner of the planet. They domesticated it in different ways in different places. Those varieties grew into land races, and then all of those different varieties from the different corners of the earth came back into this genetic whirlpool on the west coast of the United States and then in Holland. And now we have this big mix, but we wanted to untangle the the evolutionary questions. How did, how did we get to this point? And then the other question was a question about fixing a big problem that the industry has, which is that no one ever knows what they're smoking. So <laughs> especially in the United States, there's, this, there's thousands of different varieties. The names are all wrong. Patients can't get what they need. Consumers can't get what they need. And we realized that we could answer both of those questions at the same time doing basic population genetics. So around the time we started this project, uh, we saw this article in the New York Times. It's nearly impossible to find a consistent product. And the point is that you go buy something, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. It's always Russian roulette, but when you find something that does work, you go back to the same dispensary and you, it's not the same thing anymore anyway. And so the reason, there's a bunch of different reasons why this mess is present. The first one is that there are so many thousands of varieties. So this is a, just data from a website called Seed Finder, which is a pretty cool website, where they took all the varieties that they knew about, and they linked them together in this visual data set, and they drew lines between them based on the legend and the lore of what varieties bred what other varieties. And there's a lot of good data in there. Um, but it's all just hearsay, right? And it's also based on the idea that there's a strain and that strains come together and have children and those children are other strains. Um, and that's actually not how it works, which I'll explain in a little bit. So there's all this genetic diversity. There's literally tens of thousands of different varieties. Every one of those is this <laughs> sea of different <laughs> chemical compounds, right? So this is just... Plant secondary metabolism in general, cannabis is even worse. Plants just make tons and tons of different compounds. And this is how we've always taken our medicine, right, for thousands of years in this cocktail form. We get this soup of related compounds. And so there's 144 cannabinoids in cannabis, maybe hundreds of terpenes, flavonoids, and they all work together in, in a way that um, we're trying to tease apart. But combinatorially, it's just an incredibly difficult question. And then there's market diversity or market confusion. So the way it works now in America is that you, you buy a bag of seeds from Holland illegally. That's the standard procedure. And there's a name on that bag. It'll say Northern Lights. And you plant all the seeds and they're all different. So when you buy a bag of seeds from a vegetable company and you want to grow tomatoes or corn, you plant the seeds and they're all the same. You can grow a whole commercial crop. But if you buy a bag of seeds of cannabis, no one's ever done the basic plant science to make seeds that are all the same. So they're all different. And then you go through and you pick one that you like, and either you call it Northern Lights, like it said on the bag, which isn't really true because it's different than Northern Lights. They're all different. Or you call it something new, which isn't really true either, though maybe that's more accurate. 
And then the other thing that happens is that um, there's this constant thirst for novelty, and so people are always buying seeds and hunting for new things. And every now and then, someone finds something that's the new hot variety, and then everybody else starts renaming their stuff to be the same, so that because then it sells better. So there's just this confusion, and all the names are wrong, and no one knows what they're getting. So that's not how my slide looked. That's supposed to be a picture of a tree. All you're seeing is the trunk of the tree, and then under the tree it said, "Where are you on the tree?" So we started this project with the American Museum of Natural History called the Cannabis Evolution Project, um, and they were really fascinated in the way that evolution changes when you have domestication, when you take an organism from the wild and you start to let it evolve, but under your own control. So we started collecting samples from all over the world and sequencing them.、Um, And we thought we were making the family tree of cannabis. At, at this point, really early on in the project, we still hadn't realized that it was not a tree. So we set up DNA collection equipment in lots of different places. We could get adequate DNA from a little piece of leaf, a little piece of bud, or a single seed. There's enough DNA in those tiny little things to sequence and read and compare. We now have samples from all of these countries. I think we've added five or six more since this slide was made. We have samples like this.、Um, so in the 1930s, when the Marijuana Tax Act was passed and all the pharmacy bottles were taken off the shelves, collectors got hold of some of them, and it's amazing. There's, I mean, there were thousands and thousands of cannabis medicine. Types in pharmacies in the United States in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, and they have all the same. If you read the labels on the bottles, they have all the same indications that people have, that people use cannabis for now. So glaucoma, pain, insomnia.、Um, half of the, a third of these bottles say aphrodisiac on them. So it was a really popular medicine, and there's samples in there, right? So and, and those samples are like evolutionary missing links for us, and we don't know did the, those. We know that cannabis came with the conquistadors to South America, and then it moved its way up through Mexico. And but we don't know if if that's what's in here, or maybe this is stuff that was brought over in the waves of Chinese immigration in the 1800s. We're still working on these though, because we have to figure out a different DNA extraction technique for every single one of these, which is a huge hassle. So we're working through these. This is the oldest sample. We don't have it yet. I don't mean to mislead you. We are very, very close to having it. It's in the Turpan Museum in China. This is a 27-year-old, 2,700-year-old shaman's grave that was dug up in the Gobi Desert. In the basket at his feet was a really significant amount of weed, and when they looked at it under the microscope, you could see the trichomes. The chemical analysis showed that it had been surprisingly strong. The grave was clearly the grave of some kind of religious leader, and so we had good reason to believe that they were using it for. You know, spiritual purposes. Three thousand years ago. So this is an important root of the tree for us. Anyway, I hope in a couple months we'll have it. We'll sequence it. It'll turn out that some of you are smoking the direct descendants of this guy's pot. Some of you aren't. <laughs> so we had to figure out how to visualize all this data, right? And and everyone had assumed that we were going to have a tree, a family tree of cannabis, but. Evolutionary trees like this are made for visualizing the way that different species separate as they branch apart and stop being able to breed. If you are looking at one population, one species that can interbreed, they start to hybridize, and you get this tangled mess. And so you you can't look at one population with a tree. If you think about humans, they try to do something that looks a little bit like an evolutionary tree. It's a genealogy. But pretty quick, you start to get these sort of incestuous hybridization links, and if you go more than four generations, it becomes this tangled hairball. So we started trying to figure out how people who do population genetics, who who study the DNA and the relationships within one population, how they visualize it, and it turns out they're they're not very good at it yet. So one way is that you can make inferences about direct relationships using a technique called identity by descent. This is a wine grape study that was done. And you find out really interesting things about how different varieties are related to each other, and you do it kind of like the guy at Seed Finder did it. You just do a network diagram. Another way is a technique called principal component analysis, 
where you just use clustering to put varieties that are similar next to each other. You can project it into two or three dimensions. This is a study of corn. So what we did is we took both of those methods and we combined them together and we made an interactive version that people could play with. Mainly with the hope at that point that the, it would be fun to play with and that they, they would send us more samples. So this is what it looks like when you combine those two methods. This is the Phylos Galaxy. And then we went on to make a kit. Um, so that was collecting from all over the world laboriously and paying for sequencing ourselves. Um, finally, we made this kit. Um, we are shipping it to 20 different states in five different countries. It allows people to prep a little legal sample of DNA very easily. And then they send it in to us and we sequence it. And then we show them their results on the, on the web and they can see what they have. So this is a data set from, or a picture from 23andMe, which is a human genetics company. And so if you send in a DNA sample to them, they give you your results back and they say, well, you know, you're whatever, 16% Italian and 3% Japanese. And we think you're related to this other guy who submitted a sample and you get lots of different information. We're doing exactly what they do really for, for weed. So we give you all this genetic information about how common you are and what clonal relationships you have, what different population subgroups contributed to your genetic makeup, how variable your, your genes are, how true breeding the plant would be. So if you go online, it's just this three-dimensional map. You can zoom around in it. You can play with it. You can search for things. And now different growers and different dispensaries have their own constellations in there. Some dispensaries are finally starting to send letters to their suppliers saying, if you want to have stuff in our store, you have to get it tested because we want our patients to know what they're getting. So the idea was kind of that we would be able to build this huge data set and answer some really difficult questions if we could solve a market problem, if we could create a demand for consistency or meet the demand for consistency. And it's working. People are sending us tons of samples. Those samples aren't the rare, interesting ones. They're the industry samples. And so we're trying to tease apart all that mess. And the bigger the data set gets, the more we can tell people with certainty what they really have. These are just the names that everything came in with. We can see that at least 30% of the names are wrong or nonsensical. But people are already starting to log on and change the names. People send us samples of different things often, and we find out that actually they have the same thing. People are using it to settle disputes even, which I'm not sure how I feel about. But you can definitely do kind of a you know, like a DNA paternity test and figure out, you know, if your buddy really took a cutting from you and is selling it in Washington State or not, you can figure that out. So, one problem with this data inherently is that it's just complicated data. So if you zoom in on certain parts of the galaxy, and you turn on all the relationship lines, you, you can't even see some of the names. Like, it's so dense. Like this is, so this is the actual data. The dots are separated by genetic distance. The lines are first-degree relationships, either parent-child or sibling-sibling. And there's so many varieties that it's such a tangle. And the reason for that is that there is no such thing as a strain. So people talk about seed lines and clonal lines. And there are clonal varieties. If you have a plant that's good and you take cuttings from it, all of those cuttings will be genetically identical. That's a variety. But in normal agriculture, people have made genetically stable plants. And all our children are the same. No one's ever done that for cannabis. So when you cross a male and a female cannabis plant, the seeds that you get are unique individuals, just like all of us. They are as different from each other as you are from your siblings. So all of these dots are individuals. They're not strains. It's just one plant. It's genetically used. So every plant is its own special snowflake with its own crazy chemical diversity. So it's just a really, really complicated data problem. So here in Israel, as we learned in the last couple of days, they have this weird insistence on doing things correctly. And so they actually are doing experiments to figure out 
what's in the plant and how does it work? We can't do that in the United States because research is still basically illegal. So what we're doing is collecting tons and tons of data. We're comparing it with patient data and chemical data. There's this massive nationwide experiment going on and hundreds of thousands of people are using this plant. So ultimately, we're going to be able to not just figure out what are you smoking, but we're going to be able to figure out what genes control what traits. And ultimately, we're going to be able to figure out what genes and traits are related to what patient outcomes by mining all that data. And that's it.